Hello and welcome to The Thing About Golf, Golf Australia Magazine's exploration of just what it is that draws people to this most infuriating of games. My name's Rod Murray and I'm your guide for these journeys into the psyche of those for whom the game is so much more than just a game. And our guest on this episode is unquestionably in that category. Scott Hend is one of Australia's most popular players among peers and fans alike. His down-to-earth attitude and his go-for-broke style of play have proved a heady mix for all those who've come into contact with him. But there's also a serious side to Hend. As one must be to survive at the top echelons of the game for as long as he has, there burns deep within Hend a competitive desire, a desire that's taken him to 15 professional victories, including three on the European Tour. Hend is also in the history books as one of just two men to have represented Australia in golf at the Olympics, the then 42-year-old teaming with Marcus Fraser in 2016 in Rio. From his days as a youngster playing cricket and winning club championships in the Northern Territory to money games at TPC Sawgrass with some of the very best on the planet, Scott Hen's story is one that entertains from start to finish. I wanted to read something to you that you wrote last year, and I want to get your thoughts on what that means. I'd like to play golf until I'm 70. I'd like to play the seniors tour, any tour I possibly can for as long as I can. Why? What's the thing about golf, Scott Hend? Uh, golf is me. I am golf. Uh, I've always played golf for enjoyment. I've played golf for social aspect. Uh, I don't know. It's just something about golf that's intriguing to me, and I just find that every time I go out, it's something new that I learn, and there's a, it's just a, the feeling I get when I play. You've been at it professionally for more than 20 years. Surely it should have, should have lost some of the luster by now. No, not really. I mean, I guess uh, I keep telling people, you know, the old goldfish adage, they just swim around the bowl once you forget what's going on. So to be a good professional golfer for that long, I think you've got to be a little bit like that. You don't, you don't really scar up so much. You, you don't really try and change too much in what you do. You just try and keep it as simple as possible. We might talk about your approach to the game shortly because it's it's an interesting one. It's always been an interesting one. Uh, I'm interested to hear you say that thing about having a short memory, those sorts of things. I think it was Bobby Jones said that golf is just a constant stream of learning the same lessons over and over. Does that make sense to you? You find a swing key one week and you play great, and six months later you find the same swing key and you think to yourself, how did I forget that? What's that about? <laughs> yeah, you sort of get you get to a point where you're playing well, where you're hitting the ball. You know, say say you're hitting a little two yard fade, and then all of a sudden you get to a point where the fade's gone to maybe a push cut, or you come over the top pull hook, and you think, how do I just hitting that fade? Or you hit a draw and it turns into a hook. So then you got to go back to basics again. You sort of wipe the slate and start again. Is that part of it? I don't think anybody ever gets there, do they? Golf is a journey. It's never a destination, is it? Well, that's the best part about it, and that's what I was saying the other day. You got all these. Well, they call them the goats. I mean, we had that uh, Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson on the other day, and we had pretty much the the greatest of all time, Tom Brady, and then you had you got uh, Tiger playing, and even these greats from other sports want to come and play golf because it's something they cannot master, and that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Brings me to something interesting. You started golf younger. We'll get a little bit of a peek into how you got started early on. It feels to me like we sometimes make mistakes. There's a big pool of potential golfers, lots of chat about Grow the Game, who are exactly the guys you're talking about. Okay, Tom Brady, obviously, is a superior athlete. Loads of people get into their 30s and can no longer play tennis or cricket or netball or hockey. Golf's the perfect outlet for them. And we Should golf be targeting those people? If you want to still compete, but your knee's not good enough to run around the tennis court, you can still play golf. Yeah, I don't know if they could compete on a professional level. So I'm, not, I'm not talking professional. I'm just talking for the game more generally. Oh yeah, for sure. And I mean, it's less. It's it's not as high impact on your body. I mean, so my physio comes in and sees me, and I say, I'm going to go do some running, and he goes, What do you want to run? You walk for a living, you know. So these guys, they don't have to run when you're playing golf, unless you're out of position. You got to try and get back in position. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, it's it's one of those games where you can walk around, or you get to a point like my father, who's got you know, you had. Uh, in remission for cancer, but he's still got really bad hips. He has to ride in a cart. He's not allowed to walk. So you can get around it. You can ride in a cart or you can walk, and it's not a really a high-impact sport when it comes to being an amateur. No. It keeps the brain ticking over too, doesn't it, golf? Perhaps more than some other sports. For sure, unless you're lazy, you just keep playing the same golf course all the time and falling the bad habits by drinking beers and, and, and just doing your old habits. 
that would be a shame to treat golf that way, wouldn't it? Because one of the joys of the game is the different courses that you get to play. Yeah, the variety. That's, that's, what, that's what I love about it and, and getting out and seeing different styles and, and then also meeting different people the way they approach it. Yeah. What do you like? What's, what's a perfect golf course for Scott Hand? What are some of your favourites around the place? My favourite course in the world is the Greg Norman Design Moonar course at the National at Cape Shank. I'm a, I'm a member down there, mm-hmm. and I find that to be one of the most beautiful places in the world to be for golf and to just chill out and get around the countryside. And as long as you bring the Aragard because there's a billion flies down there, <laughs> but I find it to be one of the best places in the world. Apart from being probably the member that lives the furthest, furthest away because you're in Florida, have you had a chance yet to play the new Gunnamatta course down there, which is getting a lot of great raps? I haven't. I was going to go down um, last December, but the problem was I just uh, punched all the greens and I figured I wasn't going to make the trip all the way down to Victoria and go and play with the greens being renovated, so he gave it a bit of a miss. It's just like the rest of us. <laughs> that horrible two weeks for every golf club in Australia when they've, they've done the green aeration and nobody wants it. Christmas as well. I mean, come on. It's, it's, it's a, that's the time of year I get to have a bit of a rest. <laughs> Indeed. Well, of course, a rest from golf because you don't get much of a rest from golf. I think when the lockdown hit, you were stuck in Thailand. Is that right? What happened there? I had an injury in, in Qatar and I flew to Thailand to go, to go to the doctors and uh, my wife and kids were scheduled to come over on the 20th of March. So I was there, I saw the doctor, I was recovering, doing what I had to do and then they flew in and the day they landed they shut everything down and then the day after then there was no more flights from America with, with Emirates to, um, to Bangkok. So. We were there and then we just decided, well, the way things were looking in the States with the immigration and the lines to get back into the country, we said, well, we'll just stay put. So fortunately, a friend of mine had an apartment there that he wasn't using because he's stuck in Hong Kong and he said, you, you can come and stay for as long as you need. It's like a third home for you, Asia, isn't it? We'll talk about the golf and the success you've had in Asia, but you spend an awful lot of time in Asia. You live in Florida, you play the European tour, <laughs> you play a lot of golf in Asia and, of course, you're from Australia. What's the appeal of Asia? Did, did you feel comfortable the very first time you went there? Yeah, I, I, I'm very fortunate to meet some really, really good guys, some really sound guys. I mean, my my daughter's godfather is from Korea. He's American, Korea, Korean. I spend a lot of time in Korea. I've got a whole heap of good mates from all over the world that live in Bangkok. So, you know, guys from England, guys from the states, mm-hmm. all these different people that I know that all got jobs there and a base there and. It's, it's really nice because when you're on the road, uh, some people get homesick. But for me, because I've got so many friends in so many different places I can be, it feels like I've got a home everywhere I go. Asia's a real melting pot, isn't it? In some ways, oddly, the opposite of golf, professional golf in America, I would think. Yeah. I, I'll be honest with you. Even when I go and play in Europe, if I do, say, like a five or six weeks stint in Europe, I still like to go, say, Japan for a week or go to Korea for a week or go to Thailand and play for a week. It just breaks it up because it's, the culture's different, the system's different, what people think and the way they react is totally different. So it's nice to get a bit of a refresher. Yeah. It, the UK and, and, and America are different, obviously, to Australia, but they're not that much different, are they? There's a lot of recognisable stuff. We've all got McDonald's. We've all got Gloria Jeans. Asia is completely different and for some people confronting, but if you're into it, really interesting and engaging for the mind. It's more the people. I mean – in Europe, you've got the different nationalities stick together. In America, if you don't talk football, you don't talk um, other stuff, you sort of get left out of it. If you're not from the colleges, it's also difficult as well. But when you go to Asia, it's it's not sort of like that. Everyone sort of mixes and, and goes to dinner and does stuff. But when you're in Europe, like the Scandinavians stay together, these guys stay together, and that's just – just the way it always is. Asia feels like it might be a bit of a throwback in golf terms to professional golf of the European Tour in the 80s and 90s. You talk to guys who played there then, and it was much more like what you're describing. Yeah. Sorry, I just threw a banana at my wife because she's annoying me. <laughs> That's a jitter? No, but I scared the crap out of it. <laughs> you know you're going to pay for that later, Scott. <laughs> There's only half a banana. <laughs> All right. Uh, not too... Not too bad then. Let's go back to the beginning. How did you get your start in golf? I think your dad was in the Army or Air Force and you moved around a lot. You know, my dad was in the Air Force and um, he didn't really start playing golf himself till later in life because he's a bit of a cricket player and a basketball, a, a baseball player. And um, just one day, the first first taste I got of a golf course was at Miri Golf Course in Newcastle, Raymond Terrace. Um I went out and caddied for him, and I went out and caddied once, and I never caddied again because I was too busy pointing at all the kangaroos, koalas, or all the birds and stuff. And he, he said I put him off from his golf. So 
you know, I didn't really get much into it until later on took it more seriously when I was like 14. That's a 14. reasonably start, late start in the modern era, isn't it? Most of these guys who play the tour now start earlier than that. Yeah, but they all burn out earlier as well. Uh-huh. So I, I was a big cricket player. I love cricket. I played a lot of indoor cricket. I played state, state indoor cricket. I played outdoor cricket for ages, played all different sports, and then I just decided, you know, golf was – golf was me and I think I think the playing of baseball and cricket and stuff sort of helped me in, in swinging the golf club mm. we don't see so much of that anymore do we we tend to see particularly in golf the kids the, the young guys that come up have, have played almost solely golf there's a real danger yeah. in that maybe yeah I see a lot of the Koreans a lot of the a lot of the young Koreans especially the girls I mean they're really strong and they're really great mm-hmm. but they retire early because they started so early and they've hit thousands and thousands of golf balls, and that's all they've done, and they just get sick and tired of it, and they're, they're burnt out. You've got to have this happy medium where mm. you're playing golf and they're mixing other sports in there until you get to a certain age, and you go, okay, well, now I'm going to do this. And all the lessons you've learned from other sports, because, of course, there's a, a missing team element of golf, isn't there, which is probably important for professional performance, I would think. Yes and no. That's another reason why I went to golf, because of the team aspect, aspect. Um, I didn't like the idea that you could go and play a team sport as you could play football or you can play cricket. You can have an absolute stellar game. And lose. And lose a game. But that's part of team sports, and that's what I didn't like about it. And, and, and I went to golf because if I have a bad day, you know, well, I know I've got a caddy now, but if I have a bad day, ultimately it's down to me, not what my teammates are doing. Yeah. What's the right balance for practice and stuff you said? And, and, and we do see it, a lot of people hooked on this notion of being at the driving range from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m., play a tournament round in the middle. What's the what's the balance, the right balance for practice between playing golf and hitting balls? Well, how do you deal with that? Well, I think it, it might have been Jack Nichols that said it. Um, I think he said if he, he doesn't really like to hit more than three bad shots in a row at the <laughs> club, so it changes the club. Yeah. I think, I think it might have been him that said it, but um, – I'm not a guy that wants to stand on the range for hours upon hours beating balls. I mean, not saying I won't do it. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm more of a guy who likes to, you know, try and play a bit of golf, do some chipping, zip over to the range, hit a few drivers and hit a few long ones and go back to the bunkers. Uh, you could probably say I'm OCD, you know, a little bit in that way and a little bit of ADD in both, <laughs> both a bit of a mixture because I don't like to be there for one time, but I want to do it properly and then, you know, it's all – it's just one of those things where you try and mix it in to make it uh, fun yet valuable in, in your time. Mm. You, you're clearly hooked on the game. And I know you play a lot of golf, and you play a lot of golf with mates who play off 18 and 20 yeah. and 10. And that, for some of your, your professional brethren, that would be like extracting teeth <laughs> to have to play with guys like that. Why do you do that? Well, I went through the Australian PGA trainee system. So – Every Monday we play 36 holes to try and you – know, I know this – I made $180 a week working 40 hours a week in the pro shop. And to subsidise myself, we played 36 holes on Monday. So we play for prize money in the morning and then in the afternoon. So 18 in the morning and then 18 in the afternoon. And in the afternoon, it was two pros, two amateurs all to, to play 18. So I got used to the aspect that I – got to – play with people that you can't always play with someone who's better than you. It's, it's impossible. What, what's Tiger Woods do? If he, he has that sort of mentality. So you've got to be able to somehow turn it, in, turn it into a learning process and being able to meet people. And everybody loves the game. And the reason why they're out there playing, well, there's two reasons. One, their boss couldn't make it and they've been set out there. Or two, they actually love to be there. Uh-huh. So most of us love to be there and want to play. Even if, even if we play, have 85, 100, it doesn't matter. We're still – love the game and for some reason it draws us to it. So we're all the same. Just some hit the ball a bit better than others. What's been the value of that PGA traineeship, do you feel, as your touring life has unfolded? Because you would have met an awful lot of guys for whom a job is something they've never really had. And being a PGA trainee is an actual job, as you said. You put in your 40 hours and you get your 180 bucks. Yep. Well, I think it, it, it gave me a uh, an insight into – what's on the other side of the coin. So if I wasn't able to play golf for a living and do something that I really love, then this is what I'd have to do. Well, there's an incentive. <laughs> That'll get you playing well, won't it? <laughs> you can see guys growing. I mean, being a golf pro at a, at a golf club, I, I, you know, it's not as bad as sitting in an office nine to five, slaving your, your butt away, but it's not something that I wanted to do. But I had 
the training to be able to go and do it. But then I saw, you know, it's such a great game. You get to meet so many people. And I learned a lot of lessons from a lot of guys in my traineeship. Like uh, Timmy Elliott used to say to me all the time, we're out playing in the islands. He goes, mate, great check you made this week, but don't spend it too fast because it, it goes faster than it comes. So, you know, learning stuff from the older guys. Yeah, that points a bit to mentorship. On the financial side, professional golf, there are great rewards. There's great expense too, isn't it? You, you, can, you can burn an awful lot of money chasing a professional golf career. But I was, I was very fortunate that I came along. I mean, obviously a little bit later in, in, in my life, but um, Tiger Woods came on the scene and, and made prize money amazing for all those guys. If it wasn't Tiger. I mean, I know the shark does a lot for, for golf in the world, but Tiger just made it explode in prize money and endorsements and, and stuff like that. So you, you can make a great living out of it. I mean, some guys, I mean, look, Jason Day could retire now and never have to work another day in his life. You know, guys come out now, they're not worried about having a 20, 25-year career. All they want to do is come out, bang, three, four, five years, they're finished. Is that healthy? That's a big change, isn't it? It used to be golfers matured in their 30s and you had this great decade from sort of 29 to 40-ish. That's when you really played your best golf. You'd had time to learn your craft and all those sorts of things. It's a very different world now because the game's very different, isn't it? Yeah, well, a lot of the American guys, and I've got some American friends, but a lot of these American guys, when they come through college, they're taught that Stuff everybody else, it's all about you. Mm-hmm. And they're taught to be extremely selfish, extremely cocky, and they come straight out. You'll see these guys come straight out on tour the first year where they've got an invite or where they've got their card and it seems like they've been there forever because that's the way they've been mentored through the college system and they've been told it's you and you only. Don't worry about anybody else. And, you know, it gets to a point where it's just, in my opinion, it's selfishness beyond belief. There's an, there's an entitlement, isn't there? A feeling of entitlement. I'm entitled to large sums of money, free gear, first class airfares, my own jet at some point. That wouldn't have been how you started. And I wonder what impact that has on the game as an entertainment spectacle and for fans. Have you seen changes over the years and do people respond differently to golf? The thing that I, the thing that really worries me is you talk to a young guy now that's came out and I'm going to the same tournament he is, and I say, oh, what did you pay for your airfare? He goes, oh, I don't know. I said, where are you staying? He goes, oh, I'm staying in this hotel. I said, well, how much is that a night? He goes, oh, I don't know. So you're kidding me, you don't know. He's like, no, I don't know. So, well, how do you know? He goes, well, at the end of the year, or the end of the end of the month, I get a bill sent to me, and this is what it was. And so if I bought my business class airfare for 2000 return, you might have spent three. He goes, yeah, probably. I don't understand how people the, – the, I don't want to say, like, I'm old and they're young, but – these guys <laughs> don't appreciate the value of a dollar. Is that part of that PGA traineeship? That's what working for money is, isn't it? That's what you're trading off, your time and your effort and your your, your blood, sweat and tears in return for what you get at, at the end of it. And we see, we've seen historically how many boxers, football players, athletes of the past have woken up one day in their 40s and they've got nothing, having generated millions. Well, you make 100 grand, people go out and buy an $80,000 car. And then they think, oh, I've got to pay tax on that hundred grand, but I haven't got it because I've just bought a car and I've just bought a boat. You know, it it just doesn't keep coming in. Sometimes, like now, like right now, we're sitting around for months. There's no money coming no, in. That's right. It's just a lot. You know, <laughs> it's, it's part of life. The hundred k is great if you make it every week, isn't it? But of course, golf is built on the premise that you're not guaranteed to make it every week, no matter what you do. <laughs> yeah. well, normally, normally, you only have really three to five really good weeks a year. I mean, that's that's playing 25 to 30 tournaments. You, you, you'd expect you're going to be somewhere in contention three to five weeks, and you've got to sort of know at the time or feel that you've got it going and you've got to really knuckle down. I mean, other times you're just flailing away at, at the golf ball thing and you're going to finish between 40 to 60, and that's pretty much just going to square you out for the week. Yeah. Cover your exes. Do young guys come and ask you for advice? I know that Lucas Herbert's been a recent addition to the European Tour. I think you've played a lot of practice rounds with him. There's constant jibes on Twitter about who took whose money any Ooh. given time. We've got some really promising young professionals in Australia. Do they ask you for advice? And is this the sort of thing you sort of discuss with them? Some do. Some ask you about the golf course when you go and play. I mean, I was really impressed with Minji Lee. Mm-hmm. Or Min- not Minji, Min Minji Lee. <laughs> she, she's fairly impressive too, just quietly. <laughs> yeah, well, she was up at Crowns while, while Min Wu was playing and I said hello to her and she's she's a great chick and a great player, obviously. But uh, Min Wu, I thought, 
you know, I was playing in Dubai and I was going to play a practice round tee off the tee. He goes, mate, do you mind if I join you? I said, yeah, jump in. And he came out and played a few holes. I was like, man, this kid, you know, fantastic, great, prodigious talent, should go further. And um, he didn't have any any hesitations in asking me if, if I wanted to have a game. Whereas when I, when I came out and it was a shark, I was like, I wanted to play a practice round with Greg and I was really crapping myself to ask him and then, I finally got to play some holes with him at, at St Andrews for a practice round for an open, and then you know Robert Allenby and Stuart Appleby were, on, were mainstays on tour when I came out on tour, and I had to ask those guys for a practice round. And I felt a little bit, I wouldn't say embarrassed, but I was a little scared to ask him. The younger guys now, I they don't care, no matter who it is, yeah, it's which like, is good. Yeah, which of course, good. of course, it's good, and it's and it and it's good that there's guys who are happy to talk to them and, and give them advice, which I think is probably still the case for most golf professionals. I think Tiger Woods would be happy to give young guys advice. I'm sure he gives Justin Thomas and Ricky and all those guys lots of help along the way. Just to divert sure, for a moment, I'm not, sure back, I'm not sure back in the day he was. But no, no, <laughs> no, that's right. He's, second, second coming of Tiger is a different person. Tiger 2.0. I, I'm really liking Tiger 2.0. I enjoyed Tiger 1.0 too. It was amazing to watch, but this one's a little bit more human. To divert for a second, he's a bit special, isn't he, Min Woo? You would know what I mean when I say he's one of those players. He's got it. Yep. I don't know if it can be defined, but he's got it, hasn't he? Uh, I would say uh, ball striking ability, and he's got the power. And he's he's not a very big guy, but he has that he has that ability to move the golf ball way far enough to compete. And all he's got to do is just just move off a few edges and then get experience. And I think he'll go far. I mean, you look at Lucas. Lucas can hit the Lucas Herbert can hit the ball far. Can be a little bit of erratic, but being erratic is a good thing these days because it puts you up there for chance to win. Yeah, if, if the good is better, you'll take some of the bad when it comes along. <laughs> Not such a drama. That kind of paints a picture of your game in a bit of a way too. You've always been a very aggressive player, it seems to me, and you make loads. You, you've probably made more albatrosses than anybody. Was it six, I think, you've had albatrosses in practice rounds and whatnot? Yep. Uh, and you make lots and lots of eagles, but you probably make more doubles and triples too. Yeah, a few brain farts every now and then, but you know, it happens to all of us. But uh I've always been of the opinion and, and when I was learning my craft was, you know, if you play 30 tournaments a year and you made 30 cuts and you finished 40th to 60th, you're, you're not going to do very well. If you play 30 tournaments a year and you missed 12 cuts, played average in a couple, and then all of a sudden in three or four tournaments you're right up there, you're going to do much better in the game. And that's how I approach the game. Not every week I'm going to play well, and I know that. But I'm the sort of player who likes to play, you know, four, five, six, seven tournaments in a row and get a bit of a run on, and then I feel more comfortable in that way, and I know I will perform in one of them. But there's peaks and troughs, mate. It's just you want your peaks to be really high and you want your troughs to be not so low. It's a great golf conundrum, isn't it? Would you rather shoot even par with 18 straight pars or nine birdies and nine bogeys? It sounds like the second one makes more sense to you in terms of if you, if you expand that out. I'd take that because it's it's more exciting. Yeah, well, it's definitely definitely more exciting. I reckon I've written about you a dozen times over the years that you're a sort of a confidence player. You can almost watch your tournament runs, as you say. By about week three or four, Scott Hand is really starting to come into his own, and you can really produce some quite remarkable golf. What's that like? Does what does that feel like from the inside? Is that planned, or do you just know that it's going to come? Do you know when it's going to come? Is there a moment where it clicks? Uh, I, I personally, I don't I don't feel it. But TC, who caddies for me, like when we won in um, in Malaysia last year, I, I felt like I was not doing too well. But I was, as he said, and you know, look back on it, he said it looked like I was building up to a good finish. And he was more than confident that I was going to play well in the, in the near future last year. And all of a sudden we came out and I just put it together. It's just a matter of, you know, I, I was working on my driver and I worked on my putting and I worked on some, some chipping. And then it all gets to a point where, everything's coming together like this and then it all matches up and you go like that. So if there's one area in your game which is, which is weak, it's always going to let you down. You're not going to compete. So we were working on stuff continually and mm-hmm. and then I just felt, felt, for some reason, I just felt calm that week and it all just happened. And that's that's the way about the golf. That's how it works. It's a funny game. You know, one the weekend golfer shoots 85 one week, then the next, day come, next, the next week he shoots 75 and he goes, I just hit it the same as I did last week. 
what changed? How does it, how does the same person produce those two things? A guy here just last week had 61 stable foot points. Now, there's something, oh, sure. Something's gone wrong there. That's insane. But 77 off a handicap of 30. You'd Some take that. Coast 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 Christian, was it? Uh, Marucci, I think. Is it Marucci? One coast, yeah. He's, uh, he obviously, um, he's obviously been doing something else than Warren Houses. Yeah, well, clearly he's had a few years off from golf and then he's come back and clearly they got the handicap wrong because that shouldn't be possible. Anyway, I think they pinged him five shots already, so another five next week might uh, might start to sort him out. You mentioned Tony Carroll and there, your caddy. That's been a really interesting and fruitful partnership. What's the key to that? He, of course, is a, prof- a former professional touring pro himself. That could go either way, I would imagine, two touring pros if you see well, the game differently. Yeah, but we used to room together. I mean, I, I knew Tony before we – way back when I was in the training ship and, and whatever. And then uh, we played a Canadian tour together and then um, just played all that golf. And then I lost my card in, in the U.S. through injury and whatever and just playing bad. And then I went to Q school in Asia and then he was playing in Asia and Adam Levacon, another Australian guy who you know, doesn't play anymore and a few other guys were in Asia. And then I started travelling, playing Asia, and then I used to room with TC as well. So, you know, we, we know each other pretty well. We know, we know our weaknesses and strengths. And he knows exactly how I play golf because he knows how I think. And he's a, a very good tactician on the golf course. He's not an overpower of golf courses, but he's a tactician. So it matched up well because I just like to try and bludgeon everything and he likes to be tactically around it. So we try and get a good mix. And when we get it right, we get it right. And we've got it right a fair few times. Yeah, good player in his own right. I followed him around Horizons Golf Club many years ago when he shot 63. And what a thing of joy that was to watch. You're exactly right. He just hit it exactly where he was looking every time. There was nothing about it that you'd go, wow, that's amazing. But we got to about the 14. He's like, hang on a minute. He's about eight under. <laughs> he just keeps hitting it on the green and holding your putts. So, so uh, that's, yeah, uh, he's, he's what you call the, the tactitional golfer. Yeah. And that's, that's and there's, there's, in the professional world, that's pretty much how it works. Steve Stricker versus Rory McIlroy. Both can work. Yep. I mean, I played with Steve Stricker in the, uh, in the Scottish Open. I was leading after the first round and, I couldn't believe. I mean, I know, I know, I know Steve, and I've seen him in the US. But actually being out there and watching him, considering he was semi-retired, I was still impressed of how he got the ball around. Just doesn't thinks, miss, does he? Yeah. yeah, just thinks it around. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Just everything's just calm and and mapped out, and he just you know it looks like he's just unfolding something. That's how it was folded up, and this is how he's going to unfold it. Amazing. Well, he's to the team, just opening the shoulders up and trying to find it. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> It's going to go somewhere that way, and that's where we're going to go and have a look after I've smacked it. Who have been some of the, the best players, and what have been some of the more interesting players that you've encountered, guys that you watch and go, how are they doing that? There are some guys who I think um, Jordan Spieth was one of those. Jeff Ogilvy once described. He said, you play with Jordan, and he plays quite nicely, and you go, all right, and you shoot 69. You get into the scorer's hunt, and you fill it all out. He shot 65. How did he do that? Oh, I was playing with him. I never saw that. Well, that was obviously when he was putting well because you watch it on TV and all you saw was him picking the ball out of the hole. 25 foot putts, just like yeah. tap ins. Yeah. Yeah. So I think he's approaching that again, but uh, he went off the ball for a little bit. And that's that's the difference. If you, you even ask the great Australian golfers uh, like fin- Baker Finch and those sort of guys, a ball striker, usually a ball striker, if a, an average putter will have a longer career than a mm-hmm. guy who can't ball striker and is a good putter. That's usually the way that it works out. And, you know, I, I played with Bryson DeChambeau in Dubai when he, a couple of years ago, and we're, we're just looking at it, and I looked at TC, and he looked at me, and we went, well, we've got no chance of trying to club off this guy today because all the clubs are the same length. <laughs> That's right. We're talking about trying to work out someone's game. Yeah, good good, uh, good luck with that. How big are the differences between ball strikers at the top level? I think as amateurs who watch the game, we just assume all the pros hit it fantastic all the time. How big is the difference between Tiger and the 100th ranked player in the world? Well, we really notice it when the wind gets up. That's when you notice it in a tournament. If, if they set the golf course up, it's, you know, it's, it's a bit of a challenge, but there's no wind, then it just becomes a putting competition. That's just how it is out there. But as soon as the wind gets up and the, the guys can shape it a little bit, can, can get the ball out of the centre of the club to control the spin into the wind, that's usually when you see on the scoreboard that, those names sort of go up. That's what happens in the Open most times every time. Mm-hmm. The Open Championship, when, when it gets windy, you see the ball strikers come to the fall. Yeah. That's why Tiger was so good all the time. Yeah, but well, keep it down, move it left to right, right to left, do all those other sorts of things. As you say, hit the three-quarter shot. I was just listening to Darren Clark on another podcast, and he said something very similar. He said you don't see a lot of that. There's a lot of what I would call track man golf in the modern era, isn't there? 
kids who've grown up with TrackMan and they know their numbers and it produces that shot. But that seems yeah, to I be thought, for a lot the only shot. I, I, I'm a little bit at fault for that too because I've got a TrackMan but I still get on my TrackMan and I, I'm so used to because, let's say, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm old, I like to try and flight the ball whereas I look at the guy two down from me on his TrackMan, he's trying to launch it at 14 degrees, 184 club head speed, well, sorry, 100, 184 ball speed, 130 club head speed, and just hit the same shot over and over. Yet I'm standing there with the same club trying to hit it low. The nine <laughs> and shots. Opposite of yeah, and, and, and you go and play for them in a tournament on a par three, you've got 180 metres to the pin. They've got six on in their hand, and they just hit it straight up into the wind. And you're like, I just don't get that shot because I want to try and hit it low. But the way the ball is now and the way the clubs are now with the CG and the clubs and the way the ball flies – you're just better off teeing it normal and just hitting one club extra or one club less, just hitting it in the air and the ball flies straight through the air anyway. It's so much of a habit from us older guys used to be able to seeing the ball go high and low and left and right. We've still got it ingrained in mentally that you want to play that shot. Yeah. It's almost a discussion about art and science, isn't it? This came up on the podcast. It was the McKellar Journal podcast, John Huggan, who writes for the magazine, and Lawrence Donegan. They asked the same question of Rory McIlroy. That, that science seems to be taken over the game and they ask the same question of Darren Clark. But both of them said that in the end, it's the artists who will always win. Mm-hmm. Do you agree with that? that? That art won't ever be completely lost from the game and the artists have the advantage ultimately? On certain golf courses, yes. Yes, definitely. Definitely on certain golf courses. On some of the golf courses they set up here in the States, no, it's just a putting comp. Like when the boys go to Palm Springs, when they go play it, you know, the uh, waste management, yeah. it's just it's just hit it, put it. Yeah. There's, there's no there's no there's no key that you can't work out there. It's just a putting comp. I mean, if you can average twenty five putts on for the four days, you can have a chance of winning. Simple as that. T- TPC red numbers. <laughs> there's a there's a network of them, isn't there? Yeah, and it's like it's like now that we used to think that the score between ten to fourteen under was a great score for a four round tournament. Now 10 to 14 is going to make you run 40th. Mm. <laughs> it's just, you know. Is that more or less interesting? And if we assume that professional golf is just entertainment, are there dangers in that? Well, I think uh, TV has a lot to do with that as well because they sit there and they get people, oh, you know, do the, do the television executives sit there and go, we want to see someone 32 under to win this tournament. We don't really want to see somebody out there shooting 10 under struggling because the conditions are hard or the course is set up hard. I think, in a way, it's detrimental to have a, the courses torn up all the time. Um, I'm a big believer in firm, fast greens, uh, rough, fly rough. Not not rough, so it's mm-hmm. inch rough. I'm talking like an inch and a half, two inch rough, where the ball sits down a quarter of, or a third into the rough, and you you look at the shot coming into a firm, firm green, which doesn't really happen very much either because. For some reason, the greens just get watered, 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 and they're so soft. But when you've got that half flyer lie, it makes the birdies harder. But is that good for TV? I don't know. I think people want to see 30 under. Does that somewhat depend on the audience? So I play golf, and I think most people who watch golf on TV do play golf. I would much rather you stand with your hands on your hips looking at a flyer lie and you and TC trying to figure out what are we going to do here than – it's 182, that's a six iron, and I know I can drop it within a yard or two either side of that, and then it's just a matter of whether I make the putt from six, eight, or ten feet. That's more so interesting to, to me, and I wonder whether we cater enough to the golfer with TV golf coverage. Well, because of the track man, now you're going to get people standing in the fairway knowing this is the yardage I hit it when I hit it this hard. If I take a little bit off it, it goes this far. The track man can't help you out of the rough. No, that's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> it, yeah, the rough. That's, That's the difference. They just have that rough where it's a little bit wispy, a bit, bit flyerish. And I mean, we used to play tournaments around Melbourne, around Victoria Golf Club, around Royal Melbourne, when Royal Melbourne used to have really good fairways that were really fast and hard fairways before they changed the grass. And you'd hit tee shots and you'd go sit down, sit down, sit down and run through the corner into the tee trees. Now, there wasn't ever a massive amount of rough. But, gee, it, when, when Ernie shot 62, I think it was, around the Heineken back in, a long time ago, that was an unbelievable round. I mean, 10 under for, in those conditions on those greens was unbelievable. But now people think, well, 10 under should be the norm. 
Sorry to butt in, folks, but just a quick reminder that if you're enjoying our chat with Scott Hend, you might just like some of the material to be found in the Thing About Golf archives. Head to golfaustralia.com.au and hit the podcast tab for interviews with John Huggan and Mike Clayton, Sue Wooster and Richard Sattler, and lots of other intriguing golf characters in between. And whether you listen on Google Podcasts, Spotify or Apple Podcasts, don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode. It's free, and just like magic, we'll turn up in your podcast feed every couple of weeks. That's The Thing About Golf on Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. But enough of all that. Time now to get back to Scott End. Does all of that elevate the four majors above and beyond where they perhaps used to be? I feel like we focus more on the majors than we ever used to in golf. I can I can understand it. They are pretty important and pretty sort of special. But as a player, does that feel like the case? I think we have so much focus on the majors because everyone wants Tiger to get the imaginary number. <laughs> Do you? What are your I'd thoughts on Tiger? It. I'd love to see it. I think in 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 our time, in the present day, in the amount of competition that he has, obviously it's hard to say how much competition Jack had. Um, yes, he had some great players playing against him, but was the field so deep? I don't think so. So for Tiger to dominate like he did, and for a player like Phil, who kept running runner up all the time, and then finally has, you can see how good Phil is because look how many majors he's got now. All of a sudden he's won his majors, but for Tiger to win that many in that space, plus all the tournaments, in my opinion, I think he's the greatest of all time. You can only beat the fields that turn up, can't you? So Jack could only beat the fields that turn up, and Tiger can right. only beat the, the right. fields it's that turn up. It's going to go on forever until unless Tiger gets one major past him. But it's going to be an argument forever, and people are going to say, that time, this time, you know? Yeah. Do you reckon he'll get there? Do you reckon he can? 43? How old are you now, 46? Oh, yeah, 40, yeah thanks. Yeah, 46. <laughs> um, I you, think he's got a big chance. Yeah, I, I think he's still he, playing. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, he's got, uh, what's the schedule? There's like five or six majors within not very many months, is there, coming up? Uh-huh. And, Might actually work you know, to his advantage. He could win five in a row. What, yeah. what sort of slam is that going to be? He looked pretty good at the match, didn't he? I know it was a bit of hit and giggle, but my goodness, I don't think I, I don't think the ball at apex before he picked up the tee. Most most tee shots that he hit. I think I think he's got the driver under control, and 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 from what I heard from uh, Tommy Fleetwood and, and Ian Finnis, who played with him in in Japan, they said that his iron play that week when he won in Japan was it's just special. Mm. So he's gone back to his old putter, and he's putting awesome again. It's just you know. Yeah. It's hard to keep the champion down. Well, very much so. He could have walked away from the game. He easily could have retired multiple years ago, and given everything that happened, it was it tells you about his drive, the fact that he didn't have you had the chance to play with him, and you mentioned, and, and he's not the only special player we've ever seen. Who have you had the chance to play with that have made you sort of go, wow, that's different to what we usually see? Bill Mickelson. Mm-hmm. He's a uh, VJ. I played, I played against VJ, and VJ is a very, very competitive, intense person on the golf course. Still. Uh, You've seen his videos of his fitness routine at the age of 52, uh, whatever it is. I saw him the other day down the course. <laughs> He's still out there grinding away. He, just loves, yeah. he loves it. He's just, just an absolute grinder. There's nobody else that I have seen or know that, can, that works harder than he does. It's ridiculous. You, of course, are based in Florida. Lots and lots of pro golfers around there. What's it like week week in and week out? I imagine you get to play a lot of golf with fellow touring pros. You did a couple of years in America, but you've been playing the European tour and the Asian tour from Florida there, which seems like madness. What's what's life like in Florida for Scott Hind? It's good. Well, well um, Aaron Price lives just, just not far from me, and he's, he stopped playing, obviously. Uh, Timmy Wilkerson also practices at TPC, a, a Kiwi boy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cam Smith was only about 400 yards from me, bought a house, but he sold that house and since moved to the river. So he's a bit of a fisherman and he's got a new place on the river. But uh, there's a few Australians around here. When I first moved here, there was um, not many of us. There's probably only about 10 guys used to practice at TPC. And now there's about 75, 80 guys that are here practicing. So Sawgrass there's a, you're talking about there for people yeah, not familiar. TPC, Sawgrass, yeah, there's, a, there's a big contingency of golf pros that practice and play down there. But when I say play – there's not really much going on play-wise. A lot of the guys, if they're going to play, they've joined private clubs on the other side of the river, which is a hundred grand to join. And I'm not going to pay a hundred grand to join a golf course. They go and play over there, and they do that sort of stuff. So a lot of guys hit balls here, but they don't really play because the stadium course is generally quite busy. Uh-huh. Yeah, because people come from all over the world to play, don't they? It's one of those iconic uh, sort of things. I'm interested in that. Uh, 
whether you could or you couldn't. The hundred thousand dollar initiation fee golf club is that a place where Scott Hen would be comfortable? Is that your kind of golf? Doesn't feel like it. My kind of golf is, is Nudgy Golf Course in uh, in, in Brisbane. Where they're redoing the course. It's going to be the best golf course in Brisbane. And then the other golf course is obviously the National down in Melbourne. It's my two courses, and I'm, I'm more than happy to be at those two courses. I joined the National in 2003, and I've been at Nudgy since I was 1992, I think, 1991, something like that. Even those of us in Sydney have heard legendary stories about some of your feats there at Nudgy over the years, so we know that you've been a Nudgy boy up there. Have you kept your feet on the ground there, Scott? Have you had to work at that? It would be very easy, and particularly in America where – when you're a PGA Tour professional, you're almost like royalty, aren't you, in many parts of America? The treatment is off the charts. Yeah, you, well, you get everything for free, but it's not hard to keep your feet on the, ground, on the ground, mate, because like people said, you know, it, it, it's it's hard to get to the top, but it's pretty quick when you're falling back down to the bottom. <laughs> so why do you want to think you're all the way at the top and ignore everybody else who, who you've been with on the way up? I mean... Like I said to you before, if Tiger Woods said I'm not going to play a practice round with anyone who's not as good as me, then who would he ever play with? He'd play a lot of lonesome golf, wouldn't he? Which might actually suit him. He might be quite happy about that, although I don't think Tiger 2.0 would. You go past the same people on the way down as those you go past on the way up, don't you? So it pays to be. And like I said, we're all the same. Yeah. I just hit the golf ball a little bit better than some other guys in certain weeks. Yeah, yeah, just indeed. Like Let's talk about it. As I said, you had a couple of years on the US tour. And for, mm-hmm. I think that was what I've, we're talking 15 years ago now, I think. A bit longer. Oh, <laughs> four, oh, five, yeah. Yeah, a long time ago now. Did you try, have you tried to get back to that? Would you want to play on the PGA Tour? Obviously, the rewards are great. The players are the best in the world. We know that everyone wants to get there for that reason. Or are you happy to, a little bit Gary play, a bit Peter Thompson? You spend more time in an aeroplane than you would at home, I'd imagine, most years. I wish I was a bit more like Peter Thompson. A couple of majors, to be honest. <laughs> Five of those, eh? <laughs> um, I'm, I've got to a point in my life where I have two 13-year-old kids. I, I, I have a house. I have a car, a couple of classic cars I'm happy with. Um, I don't want to go play the Corn Ferry Tour for 12 months to try and get status onto the main tour. Um if I got a card by winning a major or WGC or going to the finals of the Corn Ferry and, and getting a card through that way, I'd be more than happy to come back and try. But I'm not going to go out of my way when I've got full exemption in Asia and full exemption in Europe and I can make a good living out of those tours, especially at my point in my life where I'm, I'm 47 this year. Uh, I think I'm going to be 49 when my exemption runs out on the European tour. Hopefully I can win again before then and stay there longer and then have a look at the senior tour. Mm-hmm. What about the Champions Tour in the States? It might be, aside from the Japan Women's Tour, it might be the most closed shop in golf. It's the hardest to get onto, I think. Yeah. Well, my intentions are to have a go at the, the, the PGA Champions Tour. And like I said, that's three a bit years away, but um, my intentions are to try and have a go at it. I, I, I dare say they'll probably make it even harder by the time I get a chance to get there. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know... It, it, it's a tour that exists to extend the careers of people who've already been popular, essentially, doesn't it? That, that's the purpose of the Champions Tour. It, it, it's a bit of a closed shop, so to speak. I mean, I think the guys that go to Q School, only five guys get their playing rights to actually get out there and play properly, and the rest are conditional and hardly ever get a start. So it's tough. Yeah. Of all the amazing things Peter Senior achieved in his life, I reckon that that second career he had on the US Champions Tour was by far. <laughs> he's overcome more to, to achieve that than the other incredible things he did in the game, which is not to put them down. It's just to... It was unfortunate he didn't win because he played well enough and he just it was so close to having a win. Yeah, don't mention it. It's still... We had him on this show. It still eats at him. That's the one thing that he never... He didn't achieve that he wanted to. And, and, the, and, the, and the, the thing about Pete is people don't actually realise how great a player he was and how good a career he had and, and how, how much of a driving force and a stalwart on the Australian tour and other tours. He, he was just so solid. Yeah. I was there in 2015 when he won the Masters at the age of 56. And yeah, a bunch of, it wasn't the strongest field we'd ever seen in Australia, but there's a lot of blokes there who should have hung their heads in shame and said, I just got beat by a 56-year-old. But on the other side, what a player. What an no, extraordinary player. Definitely, definitely one of Australia's greats. Yeah. What is that? It's, it's, 
it's not just hitting the ball, obviously, that separates. There's something else that separates at that level. I, as I said, I was there, and you sort of knew from the 14th or 15th onwards that of all the players that were in it, Senior had the advantage and the momentum because he'd been there before, he'd done it before, and he's got that tenacity as a player that yep. no one's going to get past him. He's not going to hand it to anybody. Um, yep. What is that? He loves golf as well. He loves golf. I mean, obviously, he's – He's like you. Well, I'm not as – I'm not as well off as Pete and, and as <laughs> it is, but he's made some pretty good business decisions over the years. But he still, it doesn't matter what the hurdle is. Pete has that driving ambition to get over the hurdle. Plus, I also heard he's still got his first golf ball that he ever played with. <laughs> and his first check, his first yeah. dollar bill. Yeah, yeah he's been uh, – he's. Oh, he's got that drive. Yeah. Lovely bloke, though, and gives back to the game. Did his time on the PGA Tour board. Really a fantastic example for any young Australian player who wants to find a mentor. Pete Senior would be a fantastic one. Let's go back to some of your earlier starts. I listened to a fabulous podcast, I think it was last year, that you did with Richard Kaufman called The Round. Mm -hmm. And I was stunned to hear you tell a story about the first time that you met Ian Triggs and what happened yeah. there. Not, yeah. to, not to try and look for controversy, but I was really interested because – for a young player, well, you, you tell the story, and if you're comfortable to, uh, of what sort of happened there. I have no beef with Trigsy. He's a, he's a nice guy. I've, I've had many conversations with him since, and it's never ever been brought up. But it's one of those things that I remember um, as a kid. I lived in the Northern Territory. I went to Catherine High School for a couple of years, and I wanted to go to the School of Excellence at Kelvin Grove. So I did the, uh, the Greyhound coach ride all the way from Catherine down to Brisbane, which is well, – probably 32 hours or something. It would have felt 48, I would imagine. <laughs> it's a horrible hit a, drive. Hit a cow on the way, so we had to change buses and that, all that sort of stuff. I got down because my, my grandmother, my, my nana lives in, in Brisbane. She's still there and now all my family's there. But um, I went out to – I've been busting my ass in 45-degree heat in Catherine. I won the club championships there, won the junior championships. I was doing all the right things, wanted to – to further myself in golf and I was told this is a great place to go. Went down there, uh, waited on the range where all the boys are lined up at Indrapilly and uh, Tricky said, hit some balls. So when I was hitting some balls and he came over, he said to me, he goes, oh, well, you're not good, good enough, go away and practice. So I'm not going to – we don't want you at this school. I was like, I was a bit, bit gutted, uh -huh. you know, so – I mean, I'm I'm not a person. If if I've got a young junior and they're hitting balls in front of me and they want to, it's their dream to do stuff. I'd never turn around and say to someone, "You're not good enough." Mm -hmm. I don't say it that way. It's just the way you word stuff. And maybe he might have been having a bad day at the time or whatever. But uh, that was a driving force for me to try and get better as well. And then later on in life, when I moved back to Brisbane, um, I said to someone, "I said, uh, who's the best person to go get golf lessons in?" And they went, well, you got two choices. you got Ian Triggs and Charlie Earp. I said, well, I won't be going to the first one. <laughs> What's Charlie's number? <laughs> <laughs> what a legend. I mean, I never look back. I mean, that guy is an absolute legend. He is, he is. He is a motivator of all things. Even today, he's like the Energizer Bunny. The last time I saw him, I think he was in his early 70s, and you couldn't keep up with him. He'd be walking along. You couldn't keep up with him. He's just amazing. Amazing. Yeah, probably trying to race five, horse four. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Two things about that strike me, Scott. When you're in Catherine and you win the club championship and you think you might be all right, it's impossible to gauge, isn't it? Because there's not enough others around for you to know how good you are. Part of what you've got to find out is, well, you've got to go to play more competitive events to find out how good you are. Not really. I mean, I'm going to probably blow smoke up my own bum here, but I thought I was pretty good because every golf club I've been at, I'd won a club championship. Okay. I'd won a junior, a grade, or the club championship. And then I played the Northern Territory Schoolboys team and we went to Perth and then I had to tee it up against Greg Chalmers, who at the time was the gun, the oh. best player, you know, one of the best juniors coming up. And I thought, well, I could play against these guys who play on lovely manicure golf courses and here I am playing on four sand greens, five grass greens and playing off hard pan grass. Maybe I got a chance. Wow. That's a great story for anybody out there whose assumption is, and this is one of the problems with golf's image. People assume that golf is for rich people and all that sort of stuff. doesn't need to be, does it? it, it that's, in fact, not true. We know that. Nudgy is full of plumbers and electricians and mechanics and, you know, Look, as well as doctors and lawyers and and everything definitely. else. And, and and I came from a military family, so there was, there was, there was no silver spoon. Yeah. 
No, that's exactly <laughs> right. And, and clearly, you've you've opted not to buy one, even if you could afford one. And that's a that's a yeah. very appealing uh, part of your personality. Of course, all of that makes one wonder. I can't imagine that in, at Catherine, you were standing there thinking, "Well, if golf's ever in the Olympics, I might be a part of that." That happened for you. The Olympics. You're an Olympian. Yeah, I know. I know. Did they give you a tracksuit? I have to work out a bit for it. They get a bit, you know. I actually tried on some of my stuff the other day. That my, my wife was laughing at me because I put the workout uniform on. I had these like these green boxes, yellow boxer shorts, and this, this singlet shirt, and I looked like the Michelin Man. <laughs> I mean, it didn't fit me when I first got it, but I don't look any good in it. Trust me, I don't look like any hundred meter sprinter. Well, you look like Marcus Fraser did when back then when you did it because he was your teammate, of course. I'm not that bad. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> more meat pies than me. What was that like, in all seriousness? I know that I spoke to you at the time and you were off the charts enthusiastic about getting to Rio and being part of the Olympics. As a kid growing up, if you wanted to be an Olympian, you would have had to do swimming or something else. Golf wasn't, was, wouldn't have even been in the thinking with golf. So what was that like? And what was the experience like when you look back now? It was amazing. I mean, uh, to be there with my brother-in-law caddying for me and then to be there with Fraze, who I know Fraze from playing in Europe and that, as a teammate, and then they had Finchie as our captain, one of the greatest Australian golfers. Mm-hmm. Awesome, awesome. It was it was unbelievable, and to say for the rest of my life that I'm an Olympian is another special thing. And I mean, Fraser and I get to be uh, the only Australian golfers for a long time for yeah. another year now. At least so. another year. Yeah, that's exactly right. There's a fair bit of controversy around that. Uh, obviously, Jason Day opted not to play. Adam Scott opted not to play. There are a bunch of others. Mark Leishman, others opted not to play for all sorts of reasons. Do you think in hindsight they made a mistake? I'm still in the, I don't think golf in the Olympics is that important camp, which is not mm. to, to downplay the Olympics. It's just as someone who grew up with golf not being part of the Olympics, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Where do you come down on that? And do you think some of those guys regret perhaps? At, well, at the time, when I look at it, so in front of me was Scotty, Jason and Mark, and then it was me, fourth in line, mm-hmm. because I won a tournament and I lost a playoff in another tournament and I got in the world ranking. So I jumped in front of Fraze to get the, the spot. Um, you know, right now we have another pandemic around the world, coronavirus at the time. They thought Zika was going to be a pandemic around the world, and, and that fortunately, I don't know what would have happened to that. That petered out, but we all got our shots and went down there with everyone was you know, worried about mosquitoes and, and doing whatever. Um, in hindsight, I don't know if Jason, I don't know, he might have an injury anyway because his back's pretty dodgy, but maybe Scotty, you know, maybe he, he could be thinking that it might have been a mistake. I mean, I don't know. It's hard to tell those guys. Those guys are very comfortable in, in their life and, and, and the way they are at the moment. But if it was me thinking about it, if I was them, I'd be thinking I've missed an opportunity. Yeah. I mean, Scotty's probably going to be representing Australia when Japan comes around anyway. Mm-hmm. And Jason's fit enough, but who knows? Another year, Cam and Mark might jump both those guys and be the two guys. And, and then again, somebody else might get a from Australia might get a, a run on and, and jump in front. Min Woo's not done, is he? Won the Vic Open, so he's off to the races in terms of he knows now about winning and what that feels like and how to get it done. So, and the and the, the world golf rankings have been frozen. So you know, a couple of these guys get. A, I mean, look at yeah. Lucas. Lucas. Lucas the same. Yeah, he runs top five and two majors and then possibly pulls off another win somewhere, all of a sudden, bang, he's in, in line to represent Australia. Yeah, so it's, a, it's, it's become a talking point in the game, hasn't it? At what point – I spoke to Sue O about this, who played for the women's team in Australia, and she was 11, I think she told me. She was on the putting green at Metro when she heard the news that golf had been accepted into the Olympics. So her yeah. attitude is completely different generationally because it was a possibility from her for her from that time on. We're not of that ilk, are we? So it would have come as a real bonus to you in that way. It's amazing. I mean, like I said, at, at the time I knew I was close. Um, but then I I was going to take a break. I didn't get into the US Open and I went and played in Thailand and won the Queen's, the Queen's Cup in, in Koh Samui, which all of a sudden just vaulted me forward. And then from then on I thought, look, I'm a big chance here. So it was a bit of a, a goal of mine and a driving force at the time to get in the team and then, you know, there I was, bang, right there. I'm, I'm sitting in sitting in, the, in Rio in the Olympics thinking it's unbelievable. I've got the, the blazer framed and put on the wall and got my little little plaque that the, the Australian Olympic Committee sends me put in with my trophies. It's just something that, you know, forever, forever in a day, um, 
I was fortunate enough to represent Australia. And unique. It's a win without having a victory, isn't it? It, 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 It's a win to have been to the Olympics, uh, and unlike winning a golf tournament where you play well for 72 holes or whatever it might be. And And I went out and watched Frey's play, and he played – I finished my round, went out and watched him play an unbelievable round, be right up there sort of looking like he's in contention to win a medal. And I think he had a course record and I had a 10 on a hole. So we both had records. <laughs> you both contributed in your own special way. You're both part of part of the uh, the history books. That was quite amazing. He led the, after the first round. I think he shot 63. And a lot of people were surprised by that, but they probably shouldn't have been. That golf course was right up his alley, wasn't it? Yeah. It was a link-style course that played like a parkland golf course. It was really weird because obviously the course was thrown together real quick and it didn't have its time to mature. Um you know, it's, it is what it is. At least we got to play. At least, at least we got back in there and, and had a go at it. But I think, it, I think that's still the course record there. Yeah, well, I imagine it would be because I'm not sure. Well, I certainly don't think there's been any professional golf played there. There was all sorts of questions about what happened, what might happen to the course afterwards, and whether it had a place to, in Brazil. And uh, I don't know the latest on that, but it was it was doing quite well there for a while. It would seem. Of course, you've been out out of golf for a while because of this pandemic. It's just been announced overnight our time, so that'll date when we've chatted. The European Tour is coming back in about six weeks' time, mid-July, six tournaments on the trot. Do you know what your situation is there? There's still lots of questions about travel and quarantine. And uh, uh, Do you know what you're going to do? Because I know you've been thinking about doing Monday qualifying, but it's a bit pricey for a Brisbane boy, 450 bucks to throw your, your hat in the ring and, and, and front up against, you know, five blokes are going to shoot 62. <laughs> Let me tell you, mate, I, I thought I'd throw my ring in the hat the other week. Last week on the Wednesday, Thursday, I played the money game at TPC Sawgrass. There was 43 players, 420 buy-in. I went around a little le- leisurely in the, on stadium course. I had 72, 76, top seven gets paid. I think I might have run about 35th. Wow. Well, yeah, that's not going to do much for you. Anything that starts with a seven, you're not you're not cashing a check. Well, the guys down there, we had, we had Furyk playing, we had Billy Horschel playing, we had uh, we had all the guys, a lot of guys from PJ Tour are all playing today. Last two days, I had a money game as well, but I decided that uh, I'd probably be better off playing in a monthly medal somewhere than throwing my money. <laughs> in the, in the you can't team. afford it, mate. It gets too expensive. I'm going to do the Monday qualifier for the Corn Ferry because it's the, the golf course is four miles from my house where the tournament. I've asked for an invite, but apparently there's only one invite, and then they've given it to. I, I did hear Sam Saunders has got it. Okay. It's $450. There's 132 players and four spots. Yep. There's two courses. So there's two fields of 132. And there's only eight spots up for grabs, but there's only four spots at each course. So 450 bucks to go out and have a game of golf. Uh, I'm going to get the wife to come and caddy for me, so that should be interesting because <laughs> we'll see what happens there. But um, The reality well, of that, Scott, is that and for some guys, this is the start of their career. They've got no choice. This is what they've got to do. It's a crapshoot, isn't it? Out of those 264 blokes, 15 are guaranteed to have a day out. And if you're not uh, one of them, you're not getting a start. Well, what what gets me and what I posted was it's $450 to go and qualify for a corn ferry tour. It's not even the big show. No. At least when you go and qualify for the big show, you're paying 450 bucks. You do the you do the Monday, you do the Wednesday for the Monday, you get through the Wednesday, you're into the Monday. You know, there's only going to be four spots, but if you get through, you're going to be playing for six, seven, eight million dollars. But the thing is, and the past rounds, there's four spots. If you don't shoot anywhere between seven, eight, nine, ten under, mm-hmm. you could even shoot eight under, and you've got a four-way playoff for one spot. Yep. There's always anywhere someone is going to just absolutely tear it up. To put it in context for people who play their local Wednesday or Saturday Stableford comp, somebody, at least two or three people always have 40 points in any field of golf. Two or three will have 40 points, guaranteed. Yep. It's the same always. thing in professional golf. There'll be different yep. four people every week, but at any given time, three or four go and sometimes it'll be you, but most mm-hmm. times it won't. So that's a it points to a very healthy professional tour in terms of competition, doesn't it, that there's that much competition to get into the competition to try to get into the competition. And it always depends on your tee time as well because you can have 132 guys. If you're teeing off at 7.30, especially when you're playing in Florida on a golf course, which we're not far from the coast wherever we are, you, 7.30 you tee it up or in Texas it gets windy in the afternoon. So you've got a 12 o'clock tee time, you're probably going to struggle to shoot 9, 10 under. Yeah. This is the way it works. Yeah, indeed. People don't think about the expense of professional golf. I guess we touched on it before. What's a rough year on tour cost? 
for a tour player. There's no doubt a bunch of ways to do it. But if you want to do it properly and give yourself a chance to play well, you don't probably want to be sharing rooms and staying budget. <laughs> you don't want to be. I'll ask my accountant here. Well, if I stayed average, what would it cost me? Three and four hundred. Is that how much I use? Holy yeah. crap! There you go. Three or four hundred grand a year I spend. <laughs> you need you need to dial it back a bit. Um, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what really scared the crap out of me is one year I said to my wife, I said, "Can you tell me what I need to make to cover all the costs that I got to do?" She told me the number, and I said, well, "Don't ever tell me that again." <laughs> you won't be able to tee it up. Your hand will be shaking on the first tee. No. You won't know what to do. But when you say that, that three or four, that includes your taxes and stuff. It's not just outlays. That's that's if you go, whatever you got to pay for tax and 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 whatever you know, your caddy tax and all your costs all together. Sure. Yeah, but if you win the FedEx Cup, it's okay. That's not staying in caravan parks, obviously. No, no, of course not. Well, is staying in caravan parks conducive to playing the sort of golf that's going to cover the bill that comes to three or 400000 Clearly not. I knew a few guys used to stay in tents and would play a tropo. Wow. What's that do for your golf? Does it improve it? I wouldn't have thought. I used to sleep in the back of the Mitsubishi Colt. I, I couldn't do the Colt? tent. What are you- in the Colt. Mitsubishi Colt used to just put the pillow in the back, fold the seats down and sleep. What are you, six foot two? How'd you fit in the back of a Colt? Yeah, but you put your head where the back window is and your feet between the middle of the seats. <laughs> Jesus. Things you had to do, mate. Things you had to do. That's the way it goes. You know, I, I, I once shared a bed in Canada with David Gleason. We had a wall of pillows down the middle. We had the, the big bed and Nathan Green, being green, he had his own bed. But Gleason and I had to share a bed. <laughs> I have to take that out too. That's a, <laughs> I can't unsee that now, now that you've said that. <laughs> uh, that, makes it, uh, that makes it difficult. On that, who have been some of the players over the years that, you would have known plenty of them. You mentioned a couple before, Adam LeVay-Cont and Tony Carroll, of course, guys that for whatever reason were the standouts when you were younger, and we do this to players all the time. They're going to win this, they're going to win that, they're going to be – and it doesn't work out for some guys. Who are some of the ones you think of when you think of that? Jonathan Riley, um, Darren Morgan. Oh, man, this is, this is a heap – you know, the list just goes on and on and on, and, and whether it was because uh, – they decided that their sponsor said, "I'm not going to pay any more money," and they couldn't put up with the with the with the thought that they were going to have to use their credit card or, or try and go back to Australia to to pay off their bill. They just decided that they're done from golf. And mate, obviously being as professional as long as I have, I've seen a lot of guys. You know, the the, the wagon wheel just going round and round and round. It churns, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. indeed. Um, it can drive you mad, professional golf, can't it? L- almost literally. Well, that's why you've got to have the goldfish mentality. Yeah. And I love to travel and I love flying. If you don't like flying no, no. and you don't like travel and you get homesick, you're not going to be a professional golfer because a professional golfer these days encompasses traveling the world. Yeah. Yeah. If you can't travel the world and you get too homesick after being away for two weeks and you better pack up shop, mate, and Fine, go and try and find something else to do. Go and become not going to work. Yeah. Go I mean, I was just talking to my wife now and we, 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 we broached on the subject of the European tour events coming up. I figured it's going to be – I may not see my family for two and a half months. Right. Depending on quarantine, then playing, and then whatever else comes up, that, that could be the scenario. Two weeks at, at either end of a trip is a month, isn't it? There's a full month just in quarantine, 14 days and 14 days. That's a month. Out unless, of the unless, unless the UK drops the quarantine thing, maybe in Spain and then Italy and those places have said they're going to drop the quarantine. So we may, we may end up going to Europe for six weeks – and then they might say, we've got the Italian Open or we might be playing in Spain. So then I'll just go into those ones. And that was the hard part I said to my caddy, to, to Tony. I said, you know, if you come, we've got to do the two weeks at the moment. And then if you want to fly back to Australia, the way Australia is, you've got to do two weeks when you arrive back. Yeah. So if you're going home for two weeks, you're just going to be in quarantine for two weeks and you jump on a plane and fly back up the caddy for me again in Europe. Right. So it's very difficult to work out how we're going to work this. Yeah, absolutely. But your intention, I'm guessing, then, is to go to the UK – when the European Tour kicks back off again, you'll be needing it, won't you? You, you need a fix, don't you, of some proper tournament yeah. golf? I want to play now. I had I had the longest break. I had 62 days off. It was a lot. I didn't swing a club for 62 days or 61 wow. days. It's the longest break I've had in 28 years of playing golf, something like that. I've never, ever gone that long without even swinging a club. At the time, I didn't miss it. But then the boys coached me, coaxed me out to go and have a game, and I went out and I played, shot sixty six off the black tees in Thailand. I went, oh, it's not bad. Again, <laughs> I it. didn't yeah. hit a ball. First swing was on the tee, wearing a mask, and I'm like, I'm loving this. Yeah, 
Fantastic. Well, it's clearly got you, Scott. I don't think we can ever define what the thing about golf is, but whatever that thing is, I reckon it's got you uh, well and truly in its grasp, and it's fantastic to see, and it's been great to chat to you, and what a wonderful attitude you bring to the game, and I'm sure that you'll have even more fans following you around watching your travails and your exploits from here on in. We look forward to seeing all those eagles and albatrosses and doubles and triples because never a dull moment. I think it was uh, Faraday described Mickelson once. He said watching Mickelson was like watching a drunk chase a balloon along the edge of a cliff. It's highly entertaining, but you just never know what's going to happen next. And I feel that your golf's a bit the same, and it's a gift to those of us who watch, mate. So thanks for taking some time today. I really appreciate it, and best of luck when you do get back to it. My pleasure. Look after yourself. What a terrific ambassador for Australia and for golf Scott Hand is. And a big thanks again to Scott for his remarkable generosity in giving us all that time. That's it for episode 20 of The Thing About Golf, but make sure to come back next time because we're in for a very special treat when we're joined by the legend that is Kari Webb. I think our tour, if you you look at just even in the the 25 years that I've been a member and, and prior to that, I think it serves us well when there's one or two dominant players. That's next time on The Thing About Golf.